So this meeting this morning is our orientation for the upcoming case reviews to um, establish our baseline measurements for our program improvement plan or PIP. Just as a reminder, that, and for those of you that may be new to this, the PIP is, um, program improvement plan arises from a federal case review called the Child and Family Services Review or CFSR. Um, those occur nationally in every state every probably six, seven years or so. The most recent one in North Dakota, round three, was in 2016, September of 2016, where they came into the state in three locations and reviewed 65 cases, which um, 40 foster care and 25 in-home cases in three locations around the state. And based on those results, they determined whether or not North Dakota was in um, substantial compliance or substantial um, conformity with a number of outcomes, um, both related to case practice and systemic factors. Um, the results of that case review showed that North Dakota was not in compliance with everything and therefore we needed to respond um, with a program improvement plan. And just as a note, no state has ever been in compliance with all of those and every state has had to write a program improvement plan. So this is not that we're unique in any way. Um, the result of that program improvement plan, uh, or excuse me, the work of that program improvement plan wound up um, fairly recently and was approved in April of 2019. It was a very lengthy negotiation with our federal partners to approve that plan. So now that that plan is approved, we as a state need to um, continue to monitor our casework practice and therefore we have to continue to review cases similar to how the federal folks reviewed us in 2016 and in previous CFSRs. So we have been working behind the scenes frantically coming up with a plan of how we're going to measure cases but there were some um, things that arose that kind of dampened our efforts or, or impacted our ability to move forward. One is the Bill 2124. That bill, um, that which is now law, allowed for the state to, to hire and start a quality assurance unit within Children and Family Services Division. And um, that was a big player in this. Another player in that that contributed to it was social service redesign, which also came out of 2124. And, the fact that we no longer had a contract with the University of North Dakota um, CFS Training Center to provide that supportive role in terms of our quality assurance process, um, which was formerly known as the Onsite Case Review or OCR. So the bill passed, the unit's been hired, and Leanne may talk a little bit about that. We're very excited to have Leanne Miller on board as, as the manager of that QA unit, and she's hired, um, or she's participated in the hiring of the unit staff. And we're also hiring for an admin assistant for that for that unit um, to support those the workforce in that regard. So we're thrilled to have them on board. Um, but because the hiring process took longer than expected, our time frame for getting to review these cases was shortened substantially. So now we're faced with having to review 65 cases similar to the federal review, um, which includes 40 foster care, 25 in-home cases by March 31st of 2020. Um, so this, this call or Zoom meeting today um, is to notify you of that and to notify you of our statewide sample that's now being um, evaluated and there's calls being made in terms of cases, uh, whether or not they would or would not fall into um, an appropriate case for an eligible case for review for the case sample. So that's happening concurrently as we're talking today. You may have received a call already from one of our um, QA unit folks to discuss that. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is what you can expect in, um, now through March 31st. In particular, we're going to spend some time on our review event coming up in January. I did want, oh, I think that's all. Is that all you wanted me to talk about, Leanne? Is there more you wanted me to say? I think that hits the highlight. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to put myself on mute, but if you need me, just let me know. Great. Well, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. As Diana said, I was hired as the QA unit manager. 
I started on November 25th, and at that time, um, well, since that time, I have welcomed six new staff. Um, most of them has started on December 2nd. So we are anxiously and um, fervently getting um, our, our feet wet and getting started with a very ambitious goal of reviewing 65 cases by the end of November or end of March. Um, so thank you for taking your time today. I hope to highlight how we're going to do that. And um, also we'll have opportunity for questions. Probably the chat box is going to be the best way to ask your questions. And given this format, uh, we're not really able to go around the, the webinar room to see who all's here. So I'm going to move along with that. But if you do have questions, please use the chat or you could always unmute yourself as well. Um, as best we can, I hope this to be a conversation um, so that when you leave today, you'll have lots of questions like we do, but hopefully um, with a little bit, few more answers and definitely more contact information. So I did send out Friday afternoon um, all of the attachments and documents that we'll be talking today. I hope you have those available. Um, at the moment, I hope I'm sharing our agenda. And we're going to talk about the period under review and the schedule. Um, in our PIP negotiations, uh, we have identified October 1, 2018, until the date the case is reviewed as our period under review. Okay, so that's the time frame for which practice will be assessed. If you've been a part of the CFSRs before, you know that that's what we mean by period under review, the time period for which practice is assessed. Now, um, I am going to jump down to the bottom part here, and we'll talk about the due dates and all that's involved later um, this morning. But to give you an um, overview of how we're going to accomplish our 65 cases, we have identified a review week in January 13th through the 17th as a week that we're going to kind of kick off the, the um, PIP reviews. And we are going to bring in reviewers to Bismarck to conduct these reviews. And we, we plan to achieve a review of 16 cases and 10 in-home cases. Then once that um, initial round of cases is completed, then the QA unit is going to take over the remainder of the reviews on a weekly basis through the end of March. Um, so we'll be having cases reviewed just about every week during that time frame. During January 20th, we're going to have three foster care cases reviewed. During February 3rd through 7th, we're aiming to review three foster care and three in-home. The week of February 10th, we aim to review five foster care and one in-home case. February 17th to 21st, we aim to review two foster care and one in-home. February 24th, four foster care and two in-home. March 2nd, during that week, three foster care and three in-home. During the week of March 9th, one foster care case and two in-home cases. And then we aim to wrap up with three foster care and three in home. And that will get us to the point of having 40 foster care and 25 cases and 25 in home cases for our total sample of 65 cases. So um, you can see that we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And even by having the review 
across so many weeks, that's a little bit different than how we've done it before in North Dakota. Um, the other big piece about this that is different is that instead of regional reviews where we go across the state um, and hit each of the eight regional human service centers and come up with a sample of cases just within that region, we're doing a what we're calling a statewide sample. So cases for all of these weeks, all 65 cases can come from anywhere in the state. Um, and that's what we're calling the, the statewide sample. So on our, back up to our agenda here on our eligible foster care cases. An eligible foster care case in summary um, is a child that during our sampling period, so from October 1st, 2018 to March 31st, 2019, at some time during that time period, uh, a child was in foster care for over 24 hours. Now they can't be 18 during the entire period under review and they can't be on a trial home visit during the entire period under review, although they could have a trial home visit as one of their placement settings. Um, but most, the, the primary category is that they could be in foster care over 24 hours during that time period, and that would bring them into the sample. Um, in-home cases are generally a family that has received in-home case management services for about 45 days, for a minimum of 45 days during that sampling period of October 1st, 18 through May 15th, 2019. And that's to allow at the end of March, those 45 days because a case could open on March 30th be open for 45 days and still come into the sample. Um, and the caveat with in-home cases is that they cannot have a child in the family in foster care for more than 24 hours. An in-home case can never be reviewed as a foster care case. However, if a child in foster care later receives, um, may have gone back home, and an in-home service case period was open, then it still can be in the sample, okay, and reviewed as a foster care case. So all of those caveats about our case sampling, if you've been familiar with how we come up with cases in the past, pretty much still um, stand. Now, if you were a part of our case reviews in 2018, um, under our process that we knew at the time as the on-site case review, we were able to bring in a feature to say that no one worker could have more than one case in the sample. And that's when we were looking at a regional sample um, during that particular review. Because we're looking at a statewide sample and we're mirroring the federal regulations for this process, the federal requirement um, and our state procedure for this round of reviews is that no one worker would have more than two cases in the sample. Now, because a worker might have a case during January 13th might mean that they could still have a case during March 9th because our review spans those multiple weeks. But we'll be tracking that. And no one worker will have more than two cases, case managers. Now, Child Protection Services, um, those services are assessed as they appear in selected cases. So if a foster care case has child protection during our period under review, that child protection um, practice will be assessed. 
Um, and so the no more than two caseworker guideline really does apply to our case managers. Within a statewide sample, we advocated because we advocated with the Children's Bureau to um, maybe put a, a cap, if you will, on the number of cases out of any one particular agency because we really do want a statewide sample. Um, what, what are um, master statisticians <laughs> assured us is that by having a purely random sample with no agency um, maximums, we would still secure that statewide sample. So the no more than two cases applies to case managers. It does not apply to agencies. So in that pool of cases, it could be county cases, it could be DJS, it could be tribal Title IV-E cases. Those are all in our larger pool. Now, I, I have a sample, as we talk about our sample, um, I wanna share with you. Can you see this Excel spreadsheet now? Okay. Our partners at the division of um, DSS, Decision Support Services, there we go. They um, go into frame to the back end of frame and they pool all of the eligible cases. And then they put them into one program and just like bingo numbers and bingo letters, they get all torn up and out they come into this type of spreadsheet. And you see a rank order from one here on our foster care tab. Out of the sample that we have, we have over, I wanna say over a thousand, oh, oh, wait a second. I thought I deleted it all, but apparently I didn't. Um, we have over a thousand cases in our sample. Now to get to our sample, we pretty much have to go from top to bottom if the case is eligible. And because we need to have interviews with key case participants, we also plan for alternate cases. So when I gave the numbers for the week in January, for example, of 16 foster care cases and 10 in-home cases, we're going to be looking at preparing at least 19 foster care cases and 13 in-home cases so that if during the review week we're not able to secure those interviews, we have an alternate case ready to go. Um, and how we come up with those cases and how we identify them and that luck of the draw, if you will, is by this rank order on our spreadsheet. We have a tab for foster care and we have a tab for in-home. Now, once we get those cases, the key case participants is really what makes securing our case sample, the partnership and the challenge in coming up with our final cases. It certainly would be easier if we could say, oh, okay, um, cases one through 19, you're in the sample. Oh, we have a few workers that are the same, so we actually have to go down, you know, to 24 or something like that. And those are the cases in the sample. But it doesn't really work that way. And that's where you're getting, starting to get the calls and will continue to get the calls from our QA unit. In the past, this effort was led by our regional office in partnership with the agencies um, to reach out and identify and secure the participation of our key case participants. Now another document that I shared, um, let me share, wait a second, that was going well, share. 
All right, here we go. We are looking for the key case participant roster. And there it is. In a foster care case, here I'm going to highlight this for you. Zoom it up. Key case participants, whether it's foster care or in home, generally always include the mother, father, and case manager in all cases for the parents, for the children in the home. Our foster care cases have a target child, and our in home cases involve all the children in the family's home. So we're looking to who are the parents in that home, generally speaking. Um, in a foster care case, if parental rights were terminated prior to the period under review, then the biological parents or the parents for whom parental rights were terminated would not be a key case participant, generally speaking. However, if their parental rights were terminated during our period under review, then they are a case key participant for that time period from the onset of the period under review up until their parental rights were terminated. So if parental rights are terminated today, those parents may or may not still need to be interviewed. Um, and likewise, the, the case manager, the current case manager, if they're not available, then the supervisor. Um, oftentimes, we will also bring in, if there is child protection, um, a worker involved during our period under review. But key case participants can also include the supervisor, like we said, caseworkers. If it's a foster care case, we're going to be looking at the key case, uh, the foster care providers that provided care during the period under review be it a family provider or a, a residential setting. Um, and if those key case participants for mother, father, or a child who's old enough of developmentally able uh, abilities, if they're not available, then we're going to look to see if we can find someone who can speak to their perspective. Now, the other thing that's going to be different in our PIP reviews moving forward, in the past, we would try and do a lot of those interviews in person. Um, and we would do phone calls as needed. Well, it's kind of the reverse. Our primary way of doing interviews in this effort is going to be through telephone or potentially through Skype. Um, we, we're still looking into our Skype technology abilities, but we want to explore that because folks will not be required to travel into Bismarck for the review. The fact that we're holding that first week's review in Bismarck is for the, the shared um, discussion, the quality assurance process um, that will need to be taken to undergo this effort. Once that review week in Bismarck is completed and the QA unit becomes responsible, then we're going to be looking at those remote um, reviews, still needing to do the interviews by phone or by Skype. So let me take a moment about that. Um, we have, we'll be hiring eight reviewers, and within our staff of eight reviewers, we're going to identify, um, start out identifying teams of three, so two reviewers. Um, that's our general preference, is to have two reviewers review a case, and two folks in the unit will be identified with that quality assurance lead role that we have in our case review process. Diana and I will continue as second level QA. And so we will be pairing our reviewers, even though they're not physically located in the same space, the wonders of technology and web programs and you know, being able to access frame anywhere is um, going to support the, the remote reviews that we will be doing. 
it will just take a lot of logistics for those agencies having paper files to be able to um, make sure that the paper file gets to one of the reviewers. And again, that will be some of the logistics that we'll take care of um, through our unit and the support of CFS. So those, uh, I don't want to jump around too much. We're going to talk a little bit about those logistics and what's needed for paper files or electronic files because we certainly know that many of our agencies have moved towards electronic files. So we have a plan for that as well. Um, but sticking with our case selection process and, and going back to our our um, spreadsheet here. Once we get some of the basic information, then we're kind of making a list here in this column of who our key case participants are. And as long as we can secure key case participants or someone to speak to their perspective, we're able to keep that in the um, sample and keep motoring down until we get to our maximum number of cases and alternate cases. And, and that's where the biggest challenge is. Um, like I said, I know a lot of our QA reviewers are reaching out to agencies, asking these questions, helping us identify who the key case participants are. Can we be in touch with them? What happens if we can't? Can we still keep the case in the sample? Um, having a lot of those conversations. Um, and, and certainly that identifying the role of alternate cases. Now, um, federal procedure has, has said that we go from the top to the bottom in rank order. And when we have to eliminate the case, then we track it and we provide this information to our Children's Bureau's partners. We identify the case and the reason why it was eliminated. So that's, that's a real high level overview of securing our case sample and the role of the alternate cases. And those, one of the questions we have outstanding especially because of the tight time frame of our reviews, is if a case is identified as an alternate and we end up not needing it that week, can we then review it the following week? You can imagine that there are some logistics for that because some of the participants may be available one week but not another week. Um, and so this, this continues to be a work of art in progress. Um, and it is our, our plan that um, for by Friday, we hope to identify all of the cases that are going to be reviewed during the week of January 13th. In the federal process and during our um, prior state's efforts, we really tried to support the local agency's efforts to be able to prepare these cases and have sufficient time to prepare the cases. We recognize this time schedule is extremely tight and it comes during very, very busy times. It comes during our transition from county to zone agencies. It comes during holidays, the Christmas vacation, the new year, Martin Luther King. There are very busy times. So we do recognize um, the tight time schedule here and we are working as hard and as quick as we can to identify these cases. Our hope is that the cases for the January review will be identified by Friday and that the, we plan to identify all the cases by the be middle, beginning to middle of January. Because as you may imagine, once we get started reviewing cases, 
it's going to be a challenge to still try to reach out and identify cases. So we're working towards being able to identify all 65 cases and the alternates along with which review week they're going to show up in before we have our first review on January 13th. So we have a lot of work before us, but that's our goal. I'm going to stop right here to, to check to see how we are on questions. Do we have any questions that people want to? OK. None have come in yet, so we're going to continue on. Um, once we identify the, these cases in the sample, then we're going to come back around to develop the firm review week schedule so people have more of the day and the time of their interviews. And what we're anticipating, um, we're going to look at the attachment of the um, review week schedule. I can find it, yeah. And you'll notice that um, there's the watermark of draft. This is something that we're still working to fine tune. Um, and certainly as we get closer to January 13th, and also as we are, so we're planning a in-person week and we're planning review weeks um, for the remainder of the time, more of those remote weeks. But we still want to have a firm, fixed schedule that we can plan and um, go by. So what we're anticipating for that schedule is Monday mornings will either be travel in for the review week or allowing the QA unit to um, take care of uh, other logistical responsibilities they have. Um, instead of an entrance conference, uh, we'll be meeting with the review teams, make sure our review schedule for the week is intact. And then for the first case, um, like a day one case, if you will, the first case being reviewed by each team will pretty much start at 1.30 on Monday afternoons. And they'll have time Typically, these are foster care cases. There's a lot of information to review and get into. So Monday afternoon, we'll allow the teams to review that information and the case file. So that on Tuesday um, will be the, the bulk of the interview day. We'll be generally still trying to interview the case managers first and then the other key case participants for that case. We're hoping most interviews can happen between 8 and 5. However, if only someone is available at 5.30 or 6 o'clock for a call, we will do our best to accommodate that need so we can keep a case in the sample and obtain their information. Then on Wednesday will be our day two case, our second case of the review week when that's possible. Um, generally, this is an in-home case, and generally, it, it's, it's kind of a catch-22. I mean, sometimes we think that in-home cases um, don't have as much information to go through. Certainly, experience tells us that's not always the case. Um, so, but generally, we'll allow the team to review the, the case Wednesday morning with interviews starting at 10 on Wednesday with interviews again going through that day for the second case. Then there's a lot of work that the re re review teams do between reviewing the information they learned in interviews and the case record and entering it into our online management system. That's what OMS stands for. Um, and meeting with their QA lead to come up with the preliminary ratings. 
One of the key features of our on-site case review process that we introduced in 2018 was the preliminary results meeting where our review team would meet with a local agency having a case reviewed so that they would have a sense of how the case fared and to receive information about those preliminary ratings. We want to keep still doing that. Um, so we're looking at the um, PRMs for the day one cases, the ones that are reviewed Monday and Tuesday, to be at 4 p.m. on Thursday. Now this is a rough estimate, folks. If we need to negotiate a different time, um, we're gonna have conversation about that during the, the scheduling process. But as a general rule of thumb, we're, we're looking at Thursday afternoon, later afternoon for that first PRM. And then on Friday, probably by about 10 o'clock, then we'll be able to have that PRM for the day two case. And we hope that um, and are aiming for our actual case review requirement, you know, elements to be conducted by noon on Friday to then let us get to, you know, be at post office or uh, back home or whatever um, is involved on Friday afternoons. So we get the case sample. We start identifying um, case, key case participants and do that case elimination process to secure our sample. And then we come back and we fill in the blanks with a firm schedule. The agencies having a case reviewed in the sample will get that complete schedule. We'll do a, a schedule up for that particular case, as well as the review week. You'll have contact information um, and to be able to support that review throughout the review week. Okay. Now we do wanna do a, a uh, just a very quick shout out to what exactly is being reviewed um, as a reminder to us that um, while we acknowledge this whole process and these case reviews have a do of, have a bit of a compliant um, aspect to it, we never want to lose sight of the larger purpose of what these um, case reviews can tell us. Um, we are working very hard to really develop a, a process so that what we're learning out of these reviews can result in that improved practice and outcomes for our children and families. That our children and families receive the services that they need to become stronger, safe, and healthy um, because of their involvement with our agencies. And the on-site case review instrument is really only one way of um, tracking how we're doing that. And I'm gonna take. There was a quick question that came in that if a child has multiple providers during the period under review, are all providers key case participants or just the most recent provider? Preferably, we want to get all providers during the period under review. Now, if there is a justifiable reason, if there is something going on where we can't get that person, then definitely the most recent is, is um, very key in that process. So um, we would have to have some conversations to know if it was eliminated because we couldn't speak to one provider who may have cared for the child for, you know, a month at the, at the beginning of the period under review, for example. So we aim for all of them, but let's talk if we can't. So, and why that's important and how we use the information um, from our case files and the information, what we hear in both what we hear and what we see can go in to inform a final rating. Um, and I'm sharing the on-site case um, rating summary. 
These items, for those that have had cases reviewed before, probably look familiar. And they certainly tie into our outcomes of safety, permanency, and well-being. Outcome one, children are first and foremost protected from abuse and neglect. And that has one item in it. And that, um, oftentimes, we might call the CPS item because certainly this is the item that um, only CPS practice is assessed because there we're looking at uh, the reports of maltreatment, our 960s that are received by the agencies. Do they have, are they initiated timely? And are face-to-face -face contact with alleged victims occurring in accordance with state policy? That's largely what item one is about. Then our second safety outcome is really looking that children are safely maintained in their own homes whenever possible and appropriate. So item two is looking at, um, is the family receiving safety services? So that's when there are safety concerns for the children in their own home, how is the agency facilitating their access to those safety services? be it emergency homemaking services, maybe parent aid, um, intensive in-home, either case management where they're in the home a couple times a week, intensive in-home therapy, those kinds of emergency services that help a child stay in their own home. The third item under this safety outcome is kind of our biggie when it comes to assessing safety and risk. Um, that in our, as we're moving towards our safety practice model and really looking at are those the present danger concerns or are these impending danger concerns? You know, where's our, the safety and risk? And are those safety and risk assessments happening um, initially and at all critical times in the case? This is also the item where safety planning in the home is, is addressed. I like to say that um, item three is really assessing the safety of children no matter where they're at, because item three is also where we look at safety concerns during visitation with their parents or in their foster care setting. It's a pretty large item. Um, and I see a question come in about parent aid files be reviewed as well um, for the period under review. We'll talk a little bit more in depth when we get to paper files, but in short, no, um, not necessarily the parent aid files. We won't necessarily need those. Um, there is a, a question also on the um, who is responsible for the elimination process. And um, ultimately, that will be the QA unit. Um, I, I will be making a final recommendation about elimination that we will then share with our Children's Bureau partners. Um, they were out at our training last week, and they really expressed their support even during the elimination process. So um, we will be working with the agencies to identify those folks and certainly considering the information that we have, um, but ultimately the, the decision to eliminate will be the QA unit and then um, during our PIP monitoring period, um, potentially up to the Children's Bureau. Okay. So, um, the, the services and the safety and risk assessment, item two and three, make up what we're looking for to assess outcomes as it relates to safety outcome two. Now the permanency outcome one is looking, is only for our target children is in foster care. So it only applies to our foster care case. And there we're looking at placement stability were the moves planned by the agency in a manner to support the accomplishment of permanency and case goals for the child? 
We're looking at the permanency goals that were in effect during the period under review. Were they established timely and were they appropriate? And then where item six looks at achieving the permanency goal. Was the permanency goal achieved in a timely manner for those closed cases or was it likely to be achieved timely in cases that are still open? Permanency outcome two looks at the continuity of family relationships for our target children and if those connections are preserved for children. We're doing that through looking at placement with siblings, the visitation the target child has with their parents and other siblings in foster care. We're looking at, at preserving connections just with other significant important relationships that they had prior to coming into care. Item nine also looks at our ICWA items. It's going to ask if a sufficient inquiry was made to whether ICWA applies or not. And then has some questions about providing that tribal notification and um, the placement preferences. Item 10 is looking at relative placement. Now this is something um, that we'll want to, to be advised of that um, we're very excited about an extended definition of identified relative in our foster care licensing um, laws and rules this past session. And that definition really did expand it up, expanded to include some of maybe the fictive kin, um, other individuals not related by blood marriage or adoption that are important to the child. We want agencies to know, for the purposes of the OSRI, this question on relative placement is still going to be looking at the birth, marriage, relative, adoption relatives. Those fictive kin under our state definition won't necessarily apply to this item, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that if a child is with a fictive kin placement, that it will be an area needing improvement. Um, but we just won't be able to consider that a fictive kin placement is identified as a relative placement for the purposes of the OSRI. Might be clear as mud, but as we work through that instrument, um, there, there was that distinction that came up last week that I thought was worthy of, of clarifying for folks. Um, and then this uh, outcome wraps up by looking at those efforts to strengthen the parent and child relationship through efforts other than just visits, okay? So that's permanency outcome two. Then we move to our well-being outcome, and well-being outcome 12 is our biggie of the agencies assessing and addressing the needs for children, parents, and foster parents. And foster parents being defined as any family caregiver. So it could be licensed or unlicensed family for the purposes of the OSRI. So this item has three subsections sections to it, um, and all of that make up the item 12. Item 13 is going to look at involvement in case planning for either the target child or all the children in an in-home case. Um, 14 and 15 are looking at our frequent and quality visits with either the child or the parents. Um, and thou, those items make up our well-being outcome one. Now in these items between permanency outcome, who we define as parents is going to, to um, may be different. They might be the same folks. It might be a little bit different. The permanency parents, uh, the, the folks we're assessing in permanency outcome two, are really those caregivers from whom the child was removed and with whom the agency is seeking to reunify. So some of those things may not even apply to the parents, but in well-being, it's a much broader definition. Um, well-being outcome two is our education item. 
how are we assessing and addressing the child's educational needs? And then well-being outcome three um, looks at the children receiving adequate services to meet their physical, dental, and, and behavioral mental health. Um, item 17 being specific to physical and dental health, and item 18 being specific to behavioral and mental health. Um, now in those two items, there is some questions related to the appropriate oversight of medications. So if you have a child in foster care on medication, be it for physical or psychotropic, um, we're going to be looking at that oversight uh, and monitoring those medications. So that is a very broad overview of the various instrument of, of the items that we're going to be assessing. Any questions on the OSRI? I'm not seeing too many on those. And, and it's an instrument we are we're been pretty familiar with. It is the same instrument that we use during the federal review. All right. So let me change my share real quick. There we go. So case files. Um, case files, what we're going to need is really that entire file. Um, although the majority of the items are assessed um, for practice during the period under review, there are a few items that do a look back from when a child entered foster care, for example. Um, there used to be a over the life of the case question uh, for CPS. That is no longer there. However, at times there may be a need to look at CPS prior to. Um, if you have questions about what files are going to be needed once we identify the case, let's have those conversations. Um, but it's the case management files and the CPS files that are needed. If there is independent living involved in a case, those files um, have been helpful as well. Um, definitely we'll be looking to see if there is a independent living plan in your case management file. We used to need the ask file when adoption was a goal or if a child was in adoptive placement. Given the policy changes in the last uh, recent past, we're no longer requiring those adoption files. So PATH um, therapeutic foster care files are not needed. Um, and like I said, the ask files are not needed. Now, for agencies having electronic files, what's worked in the past is to have that electronic record saved to either a jump drive or a CD-ROM. The CD-ROM one might be problematic in today's age of laptops that don't have a disk drive any longer. So I'm not sure, um, I think we have a few agencies or, or CAS participating on this. Um, are, we, are there still agencies that would need or want to burn to a disk as opposed to a jump drive? If you could put something in the chat box for us, I would appreciate that um, because it may meet, need some other technical problem solving, which we will totally work through. Um, I just got to thinking that, hey, my computer doesn't have a disk drive anymore. So there are electronic records. Now to have those files available to the review team, and because we are involving mailing, and correspondence. That's where this um, table down here will become very important. I don't know if you can see my arrow or not. 
So, case files for the week of January 13th really need to be in the mail by January 5th so that we have them and can get them all organized and ready to go on the 13th by January 8th. And collectively, I think across the state, I hear that gasp. I, I wish I could do something different on the timeline, but it's, it, it's, it's a tight timeline. Um, and so we're going to do the best that we can with what we've got. And we're going to partner together and all we can do is the best we can do. Um, there is a question, DJ, or not question, but DJS would be using USB drives as we are all moving our files to paperless. Perfect. USB drives, flash drives, those work well. That, that will work. Now with this time frame um, and attached to the email, we have our case preparation documents. We are requesting those in as much as possible. Um, they really help lay the foundation for our review teams. Um, given the, the tight time frame and, and holidays, I recognize that it might be hard to be as thorough and as complete as you otherwise would be. But the um, as much information for the applicable cases will be important. The, um, let's see if I can do this. There we go, share. The supervisor um, questionnaire. As supervisor supporting the workers getting ready to have their case review, it does provide that opportunity for a supervisory quick review and oversight. Do we have what we're going to be needing um, for that? And so it's a way to also partner with a worker to help prepare that file and provide certain info, you know, information on key dates. If um, there's, it's a foster care case and there's no in-home, then things can quickly become NA. It's largely a checkbox. But there is room for comments. Um, oh, our C got lost. Comments along the way um, in case you do have additional information that you would like to add. For um, foster care cases, we have a foster care narrative. And it, it provides, again, some of the demographics. Uh, lays that foundation. It also helps understand some of the systemic information um, of caseloads that our workers are trying to manage. Um, it gives them the opportunity to, to share with us what they felt really went well with the case. The CPS reports, um, we are only listing in this report the reports that were received during the period under review. Now we know that if a 960 report was received during the period re under review and received a services required finding in our item three, this is one of the pieces that I said has a look back to it. If there was a services required finding during the period under review, our review teams are going to look back to see if there was another report um, six months prior to and um, six months forward from that report. But we can get that from frame. So we're, um, please also, so we did ask for a small segment in this table if those conditions occur. It, um, so that's on this table. The in-home uh, has a very similar narrative that, that 
provides that foundation for in-home cases. Some of the questions are a little bit different, but overall it follows the, the review instrument to really help provide um, that direction to our review team of where to, to find some information. And what we do ask um, is that in all cases, whether it's foster care or adoption, that um, a genogram accompany the case file. Now, if you have a genogram during, that you're using for practice that's already in the case file, great, use it. Scan it, um, that is just fine. There's nothing magical about this particular genogram resource. However, it is a tool if you don't already have one. And if this tool is um, not helpful and you want to get a blank piece of paper and map out a genogram, we'll take it any way you want to give it to us. But those genograms really do help, especially in some of our blended um, and complex family systems. There is no adoption summary this go around. Um, our adoption partners could be a key case participant if um, it's appropriate to the case, but they would not stop a case from um, being included in the sample. And so if there is information um, on, from our adoption partners, then, then we can do that through an interview. We don't need a case summary document or the case files. Now the last document I wanted to share is um, our pink sheet. And you can't tell that it's pink from this share, but we copy it on pink paper for our review team, which is why we call it the pink sheet. Um, this, this is more of a resource or a tool for you. It's not something that you need to complete or answer all these questions, um, but it's a tool that we created for our reviewers. The top part, um, provides our reviewers a, a quick nutshell of reminders to, to share at the onset of each and every interview. Um, so you as an agency know a little bit of, of the information that we're sharing with our interviews, uh, interviewees. But then how I like to use this um, or encourage workers and agencies to use this resource is these are some of the questions you can anticipate during your interview. We remind our reviewers that they don't have a script so that they're not asking each and every single one of these questions and they might even have more questions that aren't on this sheet. Um, but it at least helps get your mind and feeling prepared because we recognize that um, coming into a review for a worker or really anyone having participating as an interviewee in this process, it can be a bit nerve wracking. And we, we just want to try and minimize that as much as possible. Um, we want to see as partners in this process, we're not assessing individual casework practice as much as we're looking at the system and what's working well and what's not working well. We understand that that doesn't stop you feeling like you're on some kind of hot seat when you're interviewing with us for these case reviews. So to take off the hot seat um, reference and such, we want you to feel prepared. And this is one way that we, we try to help you feel prepared so you can anticipate the questions that you're going to be asked. And that's what this reference does of the pink sheet. All right. So I, I went through the instrument real quick and was wrapping up. I do want to take a moment to see if there are more questions about the case sampling.
process, the elimination process, what questions, what concerns. You've heard some of the due dates now. Um, let me know what you're thinking. Um, as soon as I can get that pulled up, then we'll dive in. Okay, will reviewers have access to frame? Yes, they will. So you don't need to pull anything out of frame that's there. Our reviewers will have a, what we call a reviewer access and auditor access level. So they will be able to see, they cannot do, um, and they can't edit anything, but they can get in and view what they need to in frame. So if it's in frame, don't worry about printing it off. Um, when will we have a full list of cases to be reviewed? My goal is that we will have that full list by January 13th for all of the review weeks. My goal is that by the end of the week, we will have the list of cases for the January reviews the week of January 13th and the week of January 20th. You'll note that the week of January 20th and the week of February 17th, we're aiming to only review three cases because those are holiday weeks. Um, we have Monday holidays those weeks. So that is, that is the goal that we're working on um, and as, as we know, this case sampling, case elimination process requires a lot of callbacks from our key case participants to know whether they would be available and willing or not. Um, and so the team and I have a couple calls this week and we are very much trying to get to that January 20th goal date so that you have the list of the January cases sooner or as soon as possible. When the week fall at holiday, I think I may have just answered that. The schedule will change during holiday week so that we're reviewing one case, a team, instead of two. Now the other thing about our schedule, we're after our team has had a few weeks of operating as a team, in order to power through this many cases, we're going to break off into doing individual reviews. So the reviews that happen, I believe it's in the month of March, uh, the review team will actually become an, a team of one um, so that we can get through as many cases as possible. So folks being interviewed will only have the one person on the interview. Now we'll still have our QA leads, we're still doing second level QA, that part of the process will remain consistent. Um, but we will be going from a very large group to teams to individuals to accomplish the 65 goals, cases. Once that's done, we're going to be taking a collective breath and we are going to be looking to see how we can move forward um, in our subsequent years. We'll still be doing a statewide sample, um, but we'll, we'll look back on what lessons we've learned. Okay, let me go back to... The, the comment, uh, what I'm understanding is that one agency does not have a maximum number of cases being pooled. Is it possible for one agency to carry the bulk of the review? Potentially. Um, and that has been a concern that we continue to express by not being able to cap so many cases by agency. Um, what, what we refer back to is that, um, you know, as a statewide sample, the, the more cases an agency has in the mix, the more, you know, they, 
cases they have in that pool that could feasibly come out um, of the pool. And so, but we're still aiming to achieve a statewide sample. We're going to be tracking the cases by agency, by zones, looking at the state, and it's a conversation that we will continue to have all the way up through the Children's Bureau. Um, and what I can say on that is our, we, we expressed the concern and uh, we do need to move forward with the only kind of cap being on no more cases per worker. Um, so here workers are being contacted to start making calls to key case participants as far down on the list like 70, et cetera. Is that in preparation for the full 65 cases and not just the first week of reviews? Great question. Originally, um, in order to accomplish the full week and having multiple review events, we laid out a schedule that for the January week of 13th, for example, that we would go down as far deep as five times the sample. So if we needed 19 cases, 16 foster care, for example, 13 or 16 foster care and three alternates, we need to come up with 19 cases. So we went, took that five times because, you know, um, multiple workers, families may not be able to be located, families may refuse. We wanted to be sure to secure enough cases. Then for the following week during January 21st, then we would secure those cases out of cases 86 through 90 because we need to go three cases. Th that is a question that um, we are still working through with our Children's Bureau because as I, as I showed earlier, really the, the most stringent protocols go from one to top, so potentially one to 70 to get down to 65. Um, as of our call today, I'm not sure. Um, we do want it to be as easy as possible. We laid out the, the, lack of better words, the chunks of the sample approach because of that of the complexities and if a case was heard as an alternate can we review them the next week because they're already prepared and if everybody is available but then they were an alternate that then how do we know who our sample is going to be for scheduling purposes the next week um, it, it's a little bit of a scheduling, um, do I dare say nightmare? <laughs> it, it's it's um, very complex. Our, our partners at the Children's Bureau are, are having conversations this morning as we speak about it. Um, and we are anticipating a call in the coming days because they know that time is of the essence. If we can achieve it by going top down and reduce the amount of outreach that we have to do for cases that ultimately don't get in the sample anyway, we want to do that. I mean, we don't want to create more work than what is needed because this outreach to counties is a lot of work or to outreach to the key case participants is a lot of work. I was hoping to have a formal answer for you today on that, and I just don't. Um, so yeah, that's what I know on that. What other questions?
Okay, we go through a few more, few more questions, a um, few more items here. You know, so during the the review weeks, one of the um, conversations we've been having is during our on-site reviews. It was extremely helpful to have that local site coordinator, our regional office, and agency contacts to kind of be on the ready, if you will, that if someone missed an interview, that our teams could connect with that local site coordinator, with the agency, and hey, what happened? Did they forget? Did we have a wrong number? What, what's, what's happening here? and really um, wonderful efforts to outreach to those key case participants so that we could keep more cases in the sample and not have to start over. Um, and given that we're doing the interviews remotely um, and we're going to have the whole routine or the team in, in Bismarck say that first week, we're, we're really um, hoping to achieve that we have um, that good contact with the agency back locally where that, you know, the key participants will be so that if an interview is missed or if a phone number got transcribed, that we could still do that. So that partnering um, process will continue um, first up during the sampling process um, our sampling process is also um, being new and new staff, one that we're um, constantly trying to, to um, firm up and, and tweak and improve. The, um, I've had some ideas come in initially. I just took the case sample by chunks and gave it to the six different QA leads, uh, QA reviewers to outreach to the agency for their section. And realized that resulted in many people calling the same agency, um, trying to reach the supervisor or talking to the worker first. Those kinds of things we are trying to work out. As we go further in the sample, if we need to go beyond 86 cases, um, then we're going to look at dividing those up by agencies and having one of our QAs kind of be a, a contact with your agency and then be able to discuss here are some potential in-home cases, here are some potential foster care cases and have that kind of conversation. So um, then reaching out to the key case participants, if um, it's better for our folks to do that, we're willing to do that, able to do that. If the agency is feeling a need and able to um, convey the message out there to the key case participants, then great. Um, let's partner and make that happen. We, we want to do whatever will help those key case participants feel at ease and a desire to help the state in understanding what's happening with our child welfare um, cases. We don't want any of our families to feel that they are kind of, their case is on the hot seat. We want to elicit them as partners to help us learn about our system. So that's that partnering process that we're, um, that we're needing and preparing the case files um, as best you can with the time that you have. I, I, I understand it's a tight time frame, so we do the best we can. I also understand that once you mail off the, the file, that doesn't stop information coming in about the case. So it may be that more information will have to be shared during a secure email exchange or some way to get the most recent if there's a week and a half or two that has passed from when a case file got sent and um, when the reviewers are beginning to review the file. So there'll be some, some exchange of information that way. And then, like I said, that assistance during the review um, in being available to help, um, you know, after all the work that's gone into it, we want to try and keep as many cases in the sample as possible.
So let's go back to some questions. Are people's minds just overwhelmed? We left time in our schedule. We weren't quite sure how long this type of format was going to take. Um, but I really would like to see as many questions answered as possible. Concerns. I mean, what do we, what do you want us to know as, as we're preparing to do this? Okay, we've had a few more come in. Who do we report to that a family is willing to cooperate with the process? Um, the QA reviewer that, that contacted you about that process. If you're not sure who that is anymore, send me an email and I'll, I'll get it figured out. Um, so yeah, your QA reviewer or myself. And then with the official youth independent living files, for some cases in the PUR being with a contracted provider, should the case manager be requesting the entire IL files for this review or will IL staff be interviewed as part of the case? Diana, can you unmute and help me answer that one? I'm not recalling that we had the full IL case file before. I think our, if my recollection is in the previous process, and I think it would be the same. You're going to hear, you can hear me okay? I can. Okay. Okay. Would be that it would be expected that the, the custodial agency would have that information in their file, um, just as any other information. So we would want to ensure that they have it in, in their case record. Right? I mean, that's how we did it in the past. Okay. So it, what it's sounding like to me is that we need to um, re, um, edit this clarification that we don't need the contract provider's IL file. We will be needing to make sure that the plan is in the file and that information supporting IL services are in the custodial agency's file. Correct. Okay. So this part of our agenda is is not that it's not that we need the contract providers file we need information about the IL services in the custodial file there we go right There was a question about the role of the regional reps in this new process. Um, and at, at this point, the, the primary role is to help be aware, guide. Um, we're, we're not sure what that local site coordinator aspect is going to need to be at this point. And so in the communications of securing a local contact, if, if the agency has a, a big court trial going on on a couple of their other cases during the review week, it might be a, an outreach, a support to the agency to be the one to be available if we have a problem with uh, interviews during that review week, but something that's known and worked out ahead of the time but um, say the traditional role of a local site coordinator, that really is not um, present in this current structure. And admittedly, it's not very well defined quite yet. All right, the next one, will you be sharing an explanation for workers to give families, providers, kids about this as they describe the review to determine if a family will be reviewing, be willing to be interviewed? Um, that, that is something that we definitely are wanting to do. I know in the OCR process, we had um, kind of a stakeholder information sheet to prepare parents for participating in the stakeholder um, feedback survey. And we haven't had the time to be able to develop that specifically. 
there are what I have um, talked to our QA unit about there are fact sheets on the general child and family review process that could be for case managers for families to help with that language um, and so that's that's a yes and no um, but I do hear that we, we need to, to get on that this week. Um, okay, from the county's perspective, it would be helpful if initial contacts between reviewers and agencies be funneled through the supervisor, is that possible? Yes. Um, and and we have we're, we've tried to clarify that, and moving forward, that that's what I do hope to to be in place, um, and you know that we will do our best. I I think time is of the essence, and recognize one supervisor can be spread very thin as well. Um, we don't need immediate feedback, but um, certainly timely feedback as well. So I know that there have been a few cases where an outreach to a supervisor hasn't got, and I'm not saying any particular county, um, hasn't been in. And so in order to get the ball rolling, there has been the request to, to talk with the worker um, to at least do the initial exploring. So we're hopeful that that's not problematic, but we also don't want to create a lot of panic um, for the workers receiving their call that their case is potentially up for review. So. That is understandable. Great questions, y'all. Anything else? I know that there is a need to know the cases as soon as possible. Um, so we're working very hard on that. Is there anything else preparation wise that we can do to help support this process the early stages of this process. Okay, not hearing any. Leon? Yes. If the I know this that the UND is is recording this, so people that weren't able to be on the line can listen to it later. Yes. Do you know if the um, the group chat questions and all that business uh, is that why you're reading the questions? Just or do those also translate as part of the recording somehow? Well, I do know that a transcript of the questions is possible. I'm not sure if someone reading that format would find that most helpful. So yes, that's why I was reading the questions. I, that's yeah. what I assumed, but I thought I'd yeah. say it just for those on the phone. Yeah. Or on yeah. The, okay. It comes as a separate file, so it could get kind of clunky on, um, you know, reading that. It, it doesn't show up very well. Um, and, and yes, thank you for mentioning that. This is being recorded. We're working with our Children and Family Services partners to do that. There is a session this afternoon. Um, and so um, if, if you know of others in your agency that couldn't come this morning but can this afternoon from 1.30 to 3.30, there is still the link in my email to register or we'll be working to make this available. Um, exactly where it's going to be posted, I still need to get figured out on that, um, but we'll get it posted as, as quickly as we can. All right. Will reviewers or the list of cases include the date each file needs to be submitted by? 
Yes, that would be my plan. We want to be clear about which week a potential case is slated for review. We want the agency to know that, which then makes the case about using alternate cases a, a little bit complicated. Um, especially if we want our sample to be known by January 13th, because, you know, I, like I said, I, I am concerned that once we get going on reviewing cases middle of January, when you see how many cases we're going through, the ability to still do that scheduling. Um, so that's the case for not using alternates in subsequent weeks. Um, but we've got a case prepped and ready to go as well. So there was that time and effort to do that. So um, hopefully by the end of the week, we're going to have a firm uh, approach to our sample and at least um, one, if not both weeks of January's cases identified. And if for whatever reason, I cannot achieve that goal, I will send out an extensive update. All right. I do have one more comment or just following up with something you said during the meeting today. Um, related to how do you think your files would be coming to the agency. Um, we only heard from one agency, so those that still want to respond to that, is that something they should send to you in an email, or how would you prefer to get that communication? Yes, if there are any um, special arrangements regarding your agency's um, ability to mail or send the um, records, please send me an email. You could also give me a call, um, the number 701-238-3801. And the email address is lemiller at nd.gov. Um, Leanne, you said your, your phone number incorrectly. Did I really? Oh, yeah. wow. Oh, it's, my goodness. Um, 701, because I call you all the time. 701-238-3802. Right? Oh, yes. What did I say? Okay. Okay. You said anyway, one more time. 701-238-3802. Oh, my goodness. All right. Looking. Um, also, uh, there's the, the Pony Express, and Rachel Beam is coming to Bismarck the week of the 13th. Um, she could also carry some cases from that area if they brought them to the training center and transport them to, to Bismarck, if that's an option. Thank you, Rachel. We'll keep that in mind. All right, well, thank you all for your participation, for your great questions, um, and mostly for the great work that you do with children and families across the state. Um, it's a very busy time. I know this, or I can only imagine this feels like even more in such a hectic time, but um, you know, we've made great partners, we'll continue to make partners, and we will find our way through it and we'll learn a lot along the way. So thank you, um, and this um, is webcast like this for families, oh, um, okay for families to connect. We are checking into the confidentiality of the, the Skype kind of thing for families. It offers, um, some really nice ability to do that visual, but we are checking into the security of that for such confidential information. And that's why I don't have a final word yet on um, how interviews are gonna go. I, if we're gonna be able to use this mechanism for um, interviews, but we're checking into it. Because then there's also the scheduling and do they have either a smartphone or a computer to do that. Some families do, but maybe not everybody.
Great. If you've got more questions, keep them coming to my email, lemiller at nd.gov, um, or come back this afternoon. Thank you, everyone.